it's the Fellowship of the Geek Show, a podcast about comics, movies, and other assorted geek stuff, with Thomas Chick, Mike Marlowe, and Les Webster. Music courtesy of Manny the Martyr. You can contact the Fellowship at email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net, or find us at Facebook at The Fellowship of the Geeks, or on Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. And now, on with the show. Hey everybody, welcome to the Fellowship of Geeks podcast. Uh, my name is Thomas Chick, and joining me for this episode is Mike Marlowe. Hey gang. And Les Webster. Hello all. How are you guys doing tonight? Cool. Doing well, thanks. How are you? Doing all right, thank you. Hope everybody out there is doing well. Thank you for joining us for this episode. And before we start off, I do want to thank everybody for the overwhelmingly positive feedback and responses for our first uh, episodes. I think everybody's enjoyed it, and or at least that's what they're telling me. I, I we're we're open to having criticism and questions, so feel free to throw those our way as well. But we do appreciate the the positive response. Just just try to keep it clean, folks. That's all we ask. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this week's topic, and it's very timely. With Batman v Superman just days away and then Captain America Civil War weeks after, we kind of wanted to talk about uh, the usage of hero versus hero and if that – what's the right word I want to say? Uh, overdone trope? Well, I was going to say overdone. I was going to say overdone, but I just uh, – a story element? It's kind, it's, like kind, it's kind of a trope. Okay, a trope. There we go. It's, it's trite. It's... <laughs> wow. All right, okay. all right, all right. Save your opinions for your turn now. Come on, jeez. Okay. <laughs> um, if it's been overdone, or it's or it's definitely been heavily used over recent years. I remember growing up when I was reading comics, the only times you really saw heroes fighting other heroes, it was usually, say... Okay, a mind possession or a body possession or control through magic or or some other thing or or just the overused mistaken identity or mistaking just mistake the uh, mistaken circumstances that just temporarily put the heroes at opposite ends for just a moment and then they realize what the true situation is and then and take care of the situation. But now Nowadays, at least for the last couple of decades, at least, it's been more of a, of a philosophical reasons for battling, whether it's ideologies. It's more likely that our heroes would be fighting against each other. And, ha- yeah, has it been overdone? And, yeah, I, it seems like with as, as many story ideas that are, that are out there, that to keep coming back to having – a good guy fight a good guy. It just it seems like we kind of need to give that a, a rest for a while. At least that's my thinking. It it may sell comics and it may sell movies, but it just it heroes are not supposed to be battling themselves. They're supposed to be doing the right thing. Uh, you know, at least that's my take. Mikey, you want to join uh, j- uh, jump in and with your two cents? Oh sure. And I'm going to look at it from a little more of a commercial standpoint. I think that uh, it, it it keeps getting used, well, one, because it sells. And I think a lot of that is because it's kind of a two-for-one deal. I mean, you're getting the opportunity to get two heroes in there. Um, and even if it's because they're fighting each other for some silly or half-baked reason, or there's something, like you said, some sort of mind control thing going on, it gives the publication or movie or whatever a chance to show off with two good guys instead of one. As far as the ways in which they create that false tension, um, I'm sh- they're all over the map. But, I mean, a lot of the 
what makes it exciting, which is, I mean, it wouldn't sell if it wasn't exciting. And a lot, I think, of what makes it exciting is the idea that with a hero fight, with heroes fighting heroes, it creates a false sense of tension because nobody wants the hero to lose, but the only people in the fight are heroes. So how is it going to, what's going to happen? Oh my gosh, it's, it's just, it's just hugely tense, stressful thing, which generates excitement, which means people buy into it. So again, commercially, it makes sense. If you want to create that, creating that false sense of tension will put bums in seats, basically. And that's what they want to do. And I mean, in the last 20, 25 years, the advent of the I'm going to fall back on the phrase we talked about not too long ago, the anti-hero, the age of the anti-hero. It's easier to find heroes that are flawed enough that they're willing to take on another hero because they don't view them as a hero. I mean, let's go ahead and, and foreshadow, not necessarily spoil or preview, but foreshadow the Batman versus Superman concept. I mean, these are guys who do a lot of the same things and believe a lot of the same beliefs, but they do it from drastically different perspectives. And I mean, Batman is a pretty flawed hero at this point in time. His sense of heroism is born out of great tragedy, whereas Superman is coming from a totally different perspective. He he's a protector. He's he wants to save humanity from itself. I mean, and that's that's a borderline cynical way of looking at it, but it's true. And so they're going to view each other as a threat because they're so different. Batman's going to view Superman as an alien who I mean, he's not human. So who's to say what he really is, what's really going on in his head? And right. Superman's going to look at Batman and say, man, this poor guy's messed up. He could really hurt himself or other people out there if he's allowed to run free. And so you get that sense of tension because nobody wants to see Batman lose and nobody wants to see Superman lose. But they're fighting each other. So one of them's got to lose, right? One would think. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying there. That's definitely the approach they're taking it in, in the movie. In the comics, I would say it's it's somewhat similar, uh, especially since the change in, in, during the original Crisis. Superman wants to do what's right, and Batman wants to do – he's out for justice. Sometimes to achieve justice, you may not do what's right, or within the legal system where Superman kind of balances himself to the laws of man. Or humans, so yeah, that's it's kind of the it's kind of the same thing. They oppose each other philosophically. I, I guess that's the right word to use there. But they're they're both trying to do the same thing, just different methods and and, and attitudes. Yeah, very different methods and very different attitudes. Right, Mr. Webster. I agree with you guys. I do want to say though that back in the '60s you would pick up a Marvel comic and have the thing fight the Hulk. And all I saw of this was similar titles that they had where Daredevil would appear in multiple issues or uh, other stories. And in so doing, it was to make sure you went out and bought Daredevil. With the Hulk and the thing, they wanted to make sure you read the Hulk and you read the Fantastic Four. This time with the this movie coming up, I see where the storyline is, and it's like you guys have already explained. Batman has a different attitude about it. All he sees is the destruction, not that he's not one of those that will cause destruction himself. Yet I, uh, he's seeing the destruction, seeing what how it's harming people, and then uh, Superman is fighting, well, for his life. Uh, and I see that they're, they're balanced in that manner. Yeah. But to me, it was as a marketing ploy, as Mike was describing it, to me, the marketing ploy was uh, back in the 60s where you did have two people battle, and it was always a mistaken identity or a mistaken situation. And you, after a while, you just kind of throw up your hands because – you know who's leading the bad guys in this one. 
You know who's at fault in it. Yeah. And you just stare at the page going, can't you guys figure this out? Don't you know that the villain is sitting back behind the curtain and he's more or less manipulating everything that you're doing? I'm, I'm hoping I noticed in the trailer for one of the trailers for uh, the upcoming Batman movie that I, if I'm not uh, incorrect, they bring back Zod in a different manner. He becomes the monster that they have to fight at the end of the movie. And I believe it is Luthor that brings him back to life. Spoiler. Hey, they put it out there. They already put this out that's there. Tr- that's, that's true. That's I, thought, true. I thought Grover was the monster at the end of this book. <laughs> <laughs> we were hoping it was going to be Elmo so they could just tickle him and make it stop. But there you go. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm thinking. And to me... Well, let's let's look at this. Marvel and DC did that huge battle series, and uh, what did it accomplish? All it did was have people call in or write in and say, "I want Batman to win. I want Captain America to win. I want the Hulk to win. Whatever." And of course, the next issue, that's who would win. Whoever the accumulated the most votes. So there was no rhyme or reason to this. It was just, let's fight. Let's have some fun and fight. Popularity contest. Yeah. It, that's all it was. So I think both of those publishing companies got to see where their strengths, where, uh, the strengths were, where they failed, and then they built upon that and said, okay, well, see, they wanted Captain America to beat Batman, so we're going to give... Uh, Captain America, two more titles to make sure that everybody knows who it is. I, to me, I've got. I'm saying, let's just stop. Yeah. Don't give me another story of, wow, you're on my side. Let's go get the bad guy. It, it doesn't work anymore. It's overdone. It's trite. It's tripe. Thank you. Um. Let's let's switch over to since we're we're kind of aiming this more toward the movies, which is fine. Let me switch it over to Captain America: Civil War. Uh, as of this recording, the latest trailer dropped down, and guys, I don't know if you've watched it or I, I'm sure you who are listening to this has, or at least by the time that you hear the the recording. Under ruse. Yes, under ruse. But. The reason behind the whole division between Cap and Tony, Iron Man, is is the fact that the government is wanting to control the heroes based off the incidents in New York, which was in, in the first Avengers. The whole destruction of uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. in Washington, which happened in Captain America Winter Soldier, and then based off the events of Age of Ultron. So, so they're wanting to kind of control or police the heroes. And Tony says, you know what? I agree. We, we got to do something. We got to do something about this. We got to keep ourselves in check. And Cap's like, we, we don't, yes, we, there, there's, we're not perfect. Things get messed up, but we do not need to be controlled by anybody. We don't need, we can police ourselves. We don't need someone else to do it. Between that and then and then the whole thing with Bucky being brought back and all to answer for his crimes as the Winter Soldier is what's going to spark off this civil war. And I kind of like that. That kind of mirrors what happened to the original miniseries. It's something similar. So I kind of it, it's pretty cool. At least they're addressing. And it kind of happens in in this or Batman v Superman. It's addressing things that have happened before. There are consequences for what you have done. So I kind of like that. Uh, what's your guys' take? I'm with you there. I think it's a good idea to have continuity through the movies as they do the comics now, because we've said before on television shows. Two people may be fighting in a sitcom this week, but next week they're best of buddies like never, nothing ever happened. This continuity in a movie, I think, is extremely needed. 
I think it's one of those things that has to be shown that you're not going to mess up the comics and have to do do extreme reboots uh, like the comics did. The movies will have a continuity where people won't or can't say, hey, you can't do that because in Thor number two, this happened, and now you're saying that this other thing happened. No, let's keep it on the level. Let's keep everything on the even. I'm looking forward to this, and I think this is the way to do a film. Mikey? Yeah, I'm fine with it, too. Um, I, I like the idea. I mean, I'm, I'm good with continuity. I think that it, it just makes, from a, from a story perspective, it just makes more sense to do it that way. Um, but I also definitely think that if you're going to lay waste to your computer generated city, then you should at least have the decency to deal with the idea that computer generated people live in your computer generated city and that those people might actually be homeless because of, because the destruction in your computer generated city and or lifeless. Well, and there's that. Yeah. And so I think that if you're going to have these these people who can do these wildly magical things and call themselves protectors of the common folk, then, yeah, there need to be some sort of there needs to be some sort of recognition when they fail, for lack of a better way of looking at it, because ultimately lots of people are dying and lots of things are being destroyed because that looks really good on screen. And there need to be kind of consequences for that. And I think it's cool that they're addressing that to an extent, even if they're doing it in interesting and different ways. And that's fine. I mean, they're different companies. They should address it in different ways. And DC's gone really dark lately. And Marvel seems to be kind of the high road type company these days. And so they're dealing with it each in their own particular idiom. And that's good. I like the way they're going with that in that regard. Yep, I agree. But to me, the... The Marvel movies, uh, in specific, the Avengers Ultron movie, was just total destruction. You had a city that was ripped off, and uh, then what, what? it was plummeted back down to Earth, although they were able to get all the people, the bicycle, and the town dog on the escape unit. <laughs> but it... That's the whole cause, or that's part of the cause for the Civil War movie, because it did get out of uh, out of hand. So to me, Marvel was going dark with part of that, too. But like Thomas said, they're having to face the facts that stuff happened that shouldn't have, and they're going to pay their dues for it. Yep. I, you know, I, I mean, I agree. They they mirror each other in, in similar ways. It's just... It's, not only the fact that it's hero versus hero, but the fact that both of them are being brought about due to responses to to death and destruction of of a prior action, and this needs to be addressed. I, I kind of I, I'm digging it, so we'll see how this goes. In in comics regard, see, unless you can probably back me up on this. I kind of remember the philosophical discussions on the Justice League back in the 70s because Oliver was liberal and, and Hawkman was staunch conservative. And they always argued about stuff, but it never really got in the fisticuffs. But nowadays, if they had done something like that, it probably would have gotten. That's true, yeah. Even Hal was trying to be the middleman, yeah. and as a result, there were strained relations with both Oliver and with uh, Hawkman, Carter. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, Carter. Carter. So I think we're all pretty much on the same page that it's it's being overused just a little bit, but we understand why it's being done. And then if it's done well, then it's kind of hard to complain, right? right. Is that kind of the impression that people are happy? They spend their money, and everybody's happy, and it's it's fine. And I mean, it's like I said, they're exciting. Stories. They're exciting movies. They're exciting mm. comics, and uh, it it works. And that's the deal. The reason they're the reason they're probably overdoing it slightly is because it's working. And yeah. a time may come when it doesn't. And you know what? They'll figure out. They'll try something else when that happens. Yeah. Just like you. 
I agree. Well, cool. Good discussion. Uh, so when we come back, we will do our picks. And we're back for our weekly picks. And for this episode, I am leading off. And my first pick is from DC Comics. It's Legends of Tomorrow, number one. It's an anthology book uh, with stories from uh, Firestorm and Metal Men, Metamorpho, and the revamped Sugar and Spike, which I'm sure most people will not know who Sugar and Spike is. Less knows because less loves Sugar and Spike. It's he finally got his uh, collection a couple of years ago. They finally put that in the collection. It looks like it might be pretty fun, and they're obviously trying to capitalize on the show, especially with them using Firestorm as the lead, as the lead off on the on the book. But Firestorm story is actually being written by Gary Conway, who co-created Firestorm, so that's going to be awesome. And the Metal Man is going to be written by Lynn Wing. Who, oh God, I could take another 30 minutes to talk about the stuff he's written and created. He, he's so damn awesome. Uh, Metamorpho is going to be written and, and partially, uh, art's partially done by Aaron Leprosky, Leprosty, sorry, I'm butchering your name, man, which would be interesting seeing how that does. And then, of course, Keith Giffen is writing Sugar and Spike, so that's going to be, that should be a blast, knowing Keith Giffen. If y'all don't know Keith Giffen, oh, you gotta Google him. He created Ambush Bug. He's done some serious stuff too, but he's, he was on Legion of Superheroes for several years. But the famous Wahaha of Justice League, he was behind, he was part of the creative crew behind that. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how he handles Sugar and Spike. So I'm I'm excited about that one. My second pick is a new title from essentially a new publisher. Well, a new comic book publisher, I guess, because it's Heavy Metal Magazine. I don't think they've really done a lot in comics, to my knowledge, but I could be wrong. But the book's called Doorman, and it's written by Elliot Rahal, Daniel Kibble Smith and the arts by Kendall Good. And essentially, the doorman is, it, it literally is a doorman to Earth from other, e- either other dimensions or other planets, that kind of thing. So he's a doorman. And it's like his last day before retirement. Uh, and it's apparently been a very boring job. And then on his last day, an intergalactic assassin shows up. So all hell breaks loose, and then he's got to figure out what the hell's going on and, and try to stop uh, the assassination and that kind of stuff. It looks like it may be a really fun book, so I, I'm definitely giving that one a try. So those, those are my two picks. Uh, Mikey, what you got? All right. So this week I've got uh, my first book is Mystery Girl. Um, it is a dark horse book written by Paul Tobin and drawn by Alberto Albuquerque. Um, Issue 4 is coming out this week. Um, And this is the story of a a British girl named Trina who has this uncanny ability to pick apart any mystery that she's handed. Anything. I mean, from the the mundane to the extraordinarily complicated. Um, The only one that she can't figure out is her own, which is essentially the story of she, she, she doesn't know how she got this power. And so she is, she meets this, um, this guy who hands her this, the mystery and it's, it's somewhere between archeological and, and mystical. And so she, she gets to travel. She, they, they, he sends her to Russia and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. And she's, slowly kind of picking apart this very large complex mystery and um we're getting we're getting to the heart of it very soon in this in this arc it's been a really fun story 
my second book, and this is one that anybody who's following me on Twitter will will recognize quickly that I was going to talk about this book eventually. Um, Rat Queens number 15 is coming out. Rat Queens, for those of you who don't know, is an image comic um, written by Curtis Weave and currently drawn by Tess Fowler. And the deal with this book, it's very, very popular among the people it's popular among. And I say that, and and it may sound worse than I really intend it to be, because I'm one of them. Um, If you have any background in fantasy role-playing, this is like the most awesome book ever, just about. I mean, this is is the book that replaced Skull Kickers in my heart. Um, It is about a group of four women who are adventurers in a fantasy setting, fantasy world, and they are just a blast. They are wild, they are crazy, they are hard drinking, they are hard fighting, and they get themselves into all kinds of trouble. And they do a pretty decent job, for the most part, of getting themselves out of it as well. And this should we should be getting to the end of the third arc here very soon, if not this issue, then the next one. Um, and this is, this is one of my favorite books, like, in the world right now, or over the last couple of years. So, if you have not read Rat Queens, if any of what I have just said sounds vaguely interesting, you gotta pick it up. Check it out. Um, I'd suggest going back to the beginning, but it, it, you could, you could pick up this, this, this arc and, and be just fine. It'll, it'll make enough sense. And it'll probably make you want to read the first two arcs. Um, so definitely check those out. Bless, what you got? Before I give mine two, I want to talk about Thomas's first pick, the Legends book. I want to congratulate DC without making that issue heavy with the characters that are on the television series. They do have one with Firestorm, but the others are currently not part of the Legends TV series. I think it's great that they're bringing these others out. Sugar and Spike are older people in this one because they were originally uh, babies, tykes, when they first appeared. And then, of course, with Metamorpho and the Metal Men, uh, you've got opportunities uh, galore. They can go any direction they want. Now, to my two picks, I'm kind of holding to the theme of tonight's program. My first one is Back Issue by Tomorrow's Publishing. This is going to be an issue concerning uh, Batman and Superman, and it spotlights their some of their stories from the Bronze Age. So you're going to have things like the enemies that they switch to fight. You have the the sons of Superman and Batman, among other things there. My second choice is Lords of the Jungle by Dynamic Entertainment. This is a six-issue series by written by Corinna Betchko and art by Roberto Castro. In this, Sheena is going to be swept through time and space to 1930s Africa, where she where ta- uh, Tarzan reigns. So it's going to, going to be a question of Will they find a common ground on which to fight, or will they uh, fight each other to the destruction? So it, to me, in six issues, this could be a, a good pairing of characters, two that have been around for oh so many years and enjoyed by oh so many people. Those are those are good choices, both from both of y'all. I'm not surprised, but uh, those are good choices, definitely. I'm looking forward to all of those. Uh, is there anything else y'all want to bring up before we close out t- today's show? Um, nothing springs to mind. I think we're good. I, I think I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I do want to make one note. Within, uh, within the last week, we had lost uh, artists of one that I, I've enjoyed, uh, Paul Ryan. Uh, I'm sure if you've seen, any, if you follow any, current writers or artists or some within the last couple of decades, they know this guy and they were, uh, they were saddened by his passing. He was only like 66 years old. Uh, I know him best from 
his run on Fantastic Four during the, the during the nineties. Uh, I do want, but I do want to mention that he had passed, and I'm kind of saddened by that because I did love his work. It was some, it was some beautiful work, and it's sixty six is way too young to to leave this earth. Uh, I never have heard the details and I apologize for not knowing that, but, um, it's, it's kind of sad. I don't mean to end the, end the things on a downer, so I won't. Um, I once again, want to appreciate everybody from listening to the show, downloading this from, uh, either Libsyn or, or iTunes. We are available on both. Please, please. Feedback is always appreciated. Good, bad, or whatever. And tell uh, your friends. And yes, please, please spread the word. So, uh, check us out. Our website is, uh, www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. Uh, you can contact us through uh, there on our contact page. You can always email us, email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. We are available. We are on Facebook, The Fellowship of the Geeks. And we're on Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. You can also contact Mikey on his personal Twitter page at Mikey Geek, and I have one at Tom TC Geek. So please spread the word. We always appreciate any kind of feedback, and and just we're really loving the response we've had. We really do appreciate it. So until next time, y'all have a good night and read more comics. Thank you for listening to the Fellowship of the Geeks podcast. Comments, questions, and suggestions can be sent to email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. Please follow us on Facebook at The Fellowship of the Geeks or our Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. You can follow the Twitter accounts of Mike Marlowe at Mikey Geek and Thomas Chick at Tom TC Geek. Until next time, friends. Thank you.